I'm oh, sorry, it is my schedule. All right. Um, so we talk about uh, some of the Buddha disciple uh, explain how they attain enlightenment. Mm. So this so um, dynamic that uh, some of them attain enlightenment through hearing, through testing, uh, through keeping peace up, even through uh, touching, right? Step on the the front, they recognize <laughs> they attain enlightenment too. Mm. Dara, Mindara, Bodhisattva then rose from his seat, prostrated himself with his head at the feet of the Buddha, and declared, "I still remember that formerly, when the Buddha of universal light appeared in the world, I was a bhikkhu who used to level or abstract goals." build bridges and carry sand and earth to improve the main roads, ferries, rice fields, and ranches passes, which were in a bad condition or impassable for two horses and cars. Thus, I continued to toil for a long time in which an uncountable number of Buddhas appears in the world. If someone make a purchase at the marketplace and require in order to carry it home for him, I did it without charge. When Visvatu Buddha, Vivasu Buddha, appears in the world and famine was frequent, I became a carry charging only one course, no matter whether the distance were long or short. If my ox cart could not move in a park, I used my supernatural power to push it will free. One day, the king invited that the Buddha to a feast. As the road was bad, a level is for him. The Tathagata Vivasu placed his hand on my head and said, you should level your my ground. The things in the world will, will be on the same level. Upon hearing this, my mind opened and I perceived that the molecules of my bodies does not differ from those of which the world is made. These molecules were such as they did not touch one another and could not be touched even by sharp weapons. I then awakened to the patient endurance of the unfreed and thereby attained ownership. Then by turning my mind inwards, I realized the Bodhisattva stage and when I heard the Tathagatas, as by the Buddha's universal knowledge in the Power Lotus Sutra. I was listening, the first listener to be awakened to his and was made a leader of assembly. As Buddha now asked about the best means of profession, in my opinion, the best consists in looking into the sameness of body and universe, which are created by infection from false thought arising from the target store until this defilement vanishes and is replaced by the perfect wisdom, which then leads to realization of the Supreme Body. Actually, I love this part. Yeah, I used to tell uh, Vinvish uh, Buddhist people that um, that's what we are teaching about. So this Bodhisattva, he, um, he used to level the road, right? And uh, uh, he met a, a Buddha and Buddha said, well, uh, why don't you level your mind? Mm. Yeah, you should level your mind around, then everything should be on the same level. That's why he, he perceived that the molecules in his body did not differ from those with the words of uh, Omega mean Everything is, is the same, even his molecule, even his... Um, yeah, uh, his body, the molecule, the molecules in his body, uh, or the particles, uh, and so forth. And his body is the same as those in out there. Uh, so that's why he uh, attained the arahship. Mm. Um, in the um, Vietnamese version, it say that. Um, they have different translation. They say that when this Bodhisattva listened to 
uh, the teaching of this Buddha, and he recognizes us whenever he levels the road, uh, he need to level his mind. That means he need to treat everyone equally. Uh, he actually in Vietnamese version, it didn't mention much about the molecule, the molecules. We mentioned about uh, how he need to uh, see everyone as equal and treat everyone as equal because this is what we mean by leveling the route. You miss mm. it? Miss yeah. It? Mm. The, the molecule part's interesting too because like, yeah, uh, molecules do never really touch each other because they're, they're like repelled by the electron field. And even if a weapon is, is taken, you know, the, the weapon doesn't actually ever touch the electrons of the weapon, just repel the electrons of the atoms. So they don't ever actually touch, which is, you know, way before anybody was describing atoms and electrons. So it's, it's just, it's kind of cool that that is in there because it's, uh, it's ahead of its time as far as the scientific understanding of like of atoms. Yeah. Uh, all right. So it brings to me the story of um, Shariputra. So he was accused falsely by one of um, the monks because of jealousy. Uh, so that monk, the monk that accused uh, Shariputra uh, wrongly, uh, he mentioned that um, he accused uh, Shariputra that um, Shariputra looked upon him. But uh, non Arhat has that type of attitude or uh, that type of mind because their mind is so pure. So that's why when the, both of them came to the Buddha and Shariputra said that, well, my mind is so level, my mind is so. Uh, Okay. stable uh, my mind is so pure that I never looked upon anyone's um, my mind is like the route people could step on that with a uh, beautiful stop uh, ugly stop but whether people spit on the route um, uh, spill on the route and so forth the route is still stable so there's my mind. So what, that's what uh, Sri Putra mentioned uh, and replied uh, to the accusation of that monk. But later on, that monk, he, um, uh, he depend his karma, his mistake. So it's related to this uh, story of this monk. So in the Vietnamese version, according to my understanding, it was the same way that Mm, he see everyone as equal. There's there's no ego at all. His mind is like the round, like the way that I just mentioned about Sri Putra views of his mind. So that's why they could attend Arsh because um, there's no attachment to the ego, the self, mm, the I, the problem of uh, our ordinary people because uh, we attach to that what we call I, me, the ego there. So whoever takes something from us, whoever offend us, whoever harm us physically, physically and mentally, we feel hurt. That's why we drag in a negative way. But for them, whoever, no matter who score them, harm them physically, mentally, and so forth, they might still appease. They might still calm like the round. That's what's in Vietnamese version that I understand about. Yeah. They probably um the translator they he used the word molecules like you mentioned us so that the Westerner can understand. Hmm. Mm, okay. Hmm. Wow, that's yeah, interesting. If it's if it's like not even mentioned in the other version, yeah, 
Thanks. Um, mm. Mention it in general, but not in that in that scientific way. You know, okay. But in in his translation, so he used that word molecule so that it can uh, trigger the mind of um, the intellectual people. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So, yeah, please. Um, that's one. Andra Prabha Bodhisattva then rose from his seat, prostrated himself with his head at the feet of the Buddha, and declared, I still remember that in the remotest of eons, countless as the sands and the Ganges, there was a Buddha called Varuna, who appeared in the world and taught bodhisattvas to contemplate the element of water in order to enter the state of samadhi. This method consists of looking into the body wherein all watery elements do not by nature suppress one another. Using his subjects of meditation, first tears and snot, and then saliva, secretions, blood, urine, and excrement, and then reversing the order, thereby perceiving that this element of water in the body does not differ from that of the fragrant oceans that surround the pure lands of Buddhas, situated beyond our world. When I achieved this contemplation, I succeeded in realizing only the sameness of the element of water everywhere, but failed to relinquish my view of the body. I was then a bhikshu practicing jhana, and when my disciple peeped into the room, he saw that it was filled entirely with clear water, without anything else. As he was an ignorant boy, he picked up a broken tile, threw it into the water with a splash, and gazed curiously and left. When I came out of my jhana state, I suddenly felt pain in my heart as if I had the same trouble which Shariputra had with a wicked demon. I thought, since I have realized our hardship, I should be free from all causal ailments. Why today, all of a sudden, have I pain in my heart? Is it not a sign of my backsliding? When the boy returned and related what he had seen and done during my meditation, I said, When next you see water in my room, open the door, enter the water, and take away the broken tile. The boy obeyed, for when I again entered the dhyana state, he saw the same broken tile in the water. He then opened the door and removed the tile. When I came out of dhyana, my pain had vanished. Later I met countless Buddhas before I encountered Sagara, Varadara, Bodhi, Vikridita, Vijna, Buddha, under whose instruction I succeeded in relinquishing the conception of body, thereby realizing perfect union of this body and the fragrant oceans in the ten directions with absolute voidness, without any further differentiation. This is why I was called a son of a Buddha and was qualified to attend all Bodhisattva meetings. Yeah, I love this story too. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you've told this one a few times. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's, um, you know, I haven't had any experiences at this level where it's, it's uh, where it doesn't challenge my sort of thinking um, that, you know, someone could just completely become a pool of water. Uh, but, you know, this person must have been profoundly developed in this practice for that to happen. Or, you know, I guess one could look at it also as uh, symbolic. Mm. Um, and so, so, yeah, in this part, his method of meditation that he learned from a Buddha was viewing the nature of water within the body as being undifferentiated that all like water was the same mm -hmm. um and then eventually he that water became undifferentiated from the void and from everything and so he uh was his realization was approved and so he was he attained that state of, of bodhisattva and the story he adds I, I have to think even if it was true it's also it's also symbolic and you know the boy threw the tile in there out of ignorance and 
it's kind of interesting, like ignorance was, but it like, I'm not, I'm not clear on, on why he, he told that story in this part, because, uh, I have ideas. It definitely brings ideas to mind because like when I'm treating osteopathically in my practice, what we look for is, is the, like the original nature of the body mm. is to feel wholeness and like a fluid wholeness, like um, a, a large, like one drop of water that extends beyond the body. Mm. And when we have injuries, they become kind of dense and stuck. And so in that density, we look for where the fluid is and help it return to the fluid wholeness. And that state, you know, the mind, when someone's in that neutral state of that fluid wholeness, the mind becomes very light and people feel just uh, like a sense of release. And they're not, they're not really thinking. Um, and a lot of times they'll fall asleep. Uh, and so it's a very healing state. And so this idea of like there being an obstruction that was placed while one was kind of one was originally in that fluid state and a, some sort of obstruction was placed. Well, in order to remove that obstruction, one has to go back to that fluid state. I'm very familiar with that dynamic in my work, but I'm I'm not so clear why he told this this story within his realization because it didn't seem to, he didn't seem to see it as the cause of his realization it just seemed to be like an uh, a kind of an aside uh, so yeah. do you have any thoughts about that yeah, he, he did give one example because his he um, emerged into the water this mean somehow he his and water is at once that's why his body become water his body is sat, what do you call it? saturate, right? As water. There's no ego at all. There's no I at all. So when he, he in that type of samadhi, he becomes one of water. Water becomes part of his life, his body. That's what he meant. And of course, uh, the boy threw the broken towel there. Uh, and that's why he got hurt after he, he get out from that Samadhi, and he, he heard the boy that um, told him that he, he threw that broken towel into the water. So that's why he told the boy, "Well, when you see the water again, walk into that water and, and take out the, the broken towel." Uh, so basically, it's not. It's of course uh, for all the uh, stories that we read so far. It mentioned about the curse of their realization, right? The chorus of their awakening, right? But here, he just told the story to demonstrate that how he, in his samadhi, he went with water. That's why he had mm -hmm. attachment. There's no cell at all. There's no attachment at all. So that's why, that's why I think even he didn't mention about the chorus or the reason why he attended enlightenment, but this demonstrate how he uh, uh, he let go of his uh, his attachment to become one of water, and in our life, right? Like um, whenever we do things, and if if we really focus on things that we're doing, we want with them. For example, why we type in um, an email or uh, write essay, or like in your case. You want with your patient so that you can know well about their problems. When they explain to you their medical problems, right? And if you're once with them, you're in tune with whatever problem they have, it's easy for you to guide them how to solve. Uh, that type of problems, like a physical problem, like you say, that can guide them to let go. I don't know what you you can describe, right? Mm. Mm -hmm. But let's say if mm, somehow after their explanation about the problem, but somehow your mind is somewhere else, 
you may not guide them properly and correctly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In any kind of relationship, yeah, if uh, people uh, love us in the way that they recognize how we're in tune with them, yeah, how we are ones with them, for example, you one with your daughters, you one with your, your wife, you one with your patient and so forth. That's why they love you. Uh, uh, for us too, for me too, when they talk with them, when with Buddhist people, if I am in merge, I merge into that kind of conversation, they understand what I'm talking about. We have a lot of distraction when I'm talking this this uh matter, but somehow my mind jumping from one chapter to the other, they recognize and not sincere and not focused. Mm -hmm. In the at this temple, you know, the way that the monks and nuns hit the bell, who uh, 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 we could recognize how my poor the monks and nuns is whenever they hit the bell. You know why? You know how? Hmm. Well, there's. I I imagine. I what can I can imagine how because there's probably if you have hit the bell quite a bit, you there's probably a special place to hit the bell. Not only the on the bell, but also on the thing you're hitting it with. And if you're not paying attention, you probably won't hit that special place, and so the sound will be different. That's what I would think. Not a special place, but you need to hit the bell in the way that make people calm, in the way that the sound vibrates in the wholesome way. Of course, you have to have the skill to hit, but you have to be mindful. You have to be mindful why you are hitting the bell. Otherwise, I put it this way, otherwise, um, you know, the, the bell were designed in a special way that um, made the sound, right? It's quite different from the table, uh, it's different from how we hit the table, how we hit the uh, the wall, right? Because the bell was designed in a way that wake up people, to help people um, to uh, to be careful or to start with the ceremony and so forth. So the way that the monks know in the temple that they need to hit in the way that help people to calm the mind while awakening them, while alerting them that they start the ceremony. If they hit too strong, uh, too hard, if they strike the bell too hard, too strong, and uh, uh, or to stop, um, people recognize that that kind of um, uh, vibration, that type of level of the mind. Anyways, like, um, you know, I don't know whether you know piano, you, you play some kind of musical instrument, right? Mm -hmm. For the skillful people, for the musician, the skillful musician, they recognize and the vibration of that type of uh, in, uh, musical instrument. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all the same way. Anyway, come back here. Yeah, I still wonder that uh, somehow when the boy opened the door and walk, step into that water, I don't know whether that water, that kind of water was spilling out or not, or uh, like mercury. <laughs> <laughs> you know mm, yeah i i see it as like there's steps that go down into the room uh -huh. and the door is above that in my mind that's what it does automatically you open the door and then to get into the room you have to go down steps because yeah it's it's just, everything the water everything is the water. yeah <laughs> yeah that's really funny yeah i love this two story yeah i used to tell this two story for them mm, anyway mm -hmm. yeah okay so last one here. Mm, okay. That's why he say the patient endurance, that's work with the the level of the, the route. That's what I'm talking about. 
uh, Shariputra means there. Shariputra experience uh, or explanation to the Buddha after he was accused wrongly by other monks. Is my soul stable? Is my soul level? That's the, he could and do anything. The Rao is so stable, you understand? Right? Mm -hmm. So stable, yeah. he can endure anything. But the good or bad people can sp split on on the Rao, step on the Rao, uh, pour the poor, pour the uh, dirty, uh, pure water on the Rao. He still accept that. So does the mind of people. So does the action, so do the action of the people. He could accept anything. That's what I think, that's, that's what the patient of patient endurance is about mm. yeah. the bodhisattva of crystal light then rose from his seat prostrate himself with his head at the feet of the buddha and declare i still remember that once in the modes of errors countless as sense at the sense of in the against uh there was a buddha called infinite infinite uh, voice who appears in the world to reveal to the Bodhisattva's profoundly enlightened fundamental awareness, which by looking into this world and the body forms of all living beings, could perceive that all were created by the power of the winds arising from illusory concurrent causes. At that time, I inquired into the illusory setting up of the world, changing time, body motion, and motionlessness, stealing of the mind. In other words, all kind of movements which were fundamentally the same and did not differ from one another. Then I realized that these movements had neither ways to come nor with them to go. The all living beings in the ten directions as uncountable as the dust came from the same force and hold. Likewise, all living beings in every small world of the red Gilliscombs were like mosquitoes in a trap in which they um, endlessly and drew a mad tumors. Soon after meeting that Buddha, I realized the patient endurance of the unbreeded, of the uh, unbreeded. As my mind opened, I perceived the land of the imperturbable Buddhas in the Eastern region where we were submitted as a son of the Dharma king. Uh, serving all the Buddhas in ten directions, my body and mind gave out rays of light that illuminates all the worlds without obstruction. So this Bodhisattva talk about, he recognized the wind, right? Uh, the wind rising from illusory concurrent coast. Uh, so, he, but he recognized us where the uh, the body movement, body motions, uh, changing time and so forth, um, they same. Uh, they did not differ from others, so that's why um, there's no common goal. Uh, they know, um, yeah. Mm. So everything come from the same force food, um, even the small word of the great. Um, you know what's mean? Telescomps, you know what's mean? Oh, you know. No. Uh, okay, let me. Um, yeah, let me copy. Yeah, let me. Um, I was going to look it up if, if, if you didn't uh, you didn't address it. This is one of the Buddhist um, terminology. Oh, okay. Oh, correction of many world systems. Mm. Yeah. This one here. Chilly occasion. Not many words. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. So um from small to the red one, it's like a mosquito in a trap. So he used that analogy. So he used analogy we like mosquito in the trap. We we get um, flying around in the mud tumult, right? So mm -hmm. So that's why he recognized that everything should be the same. Every movement, sorry, uh, every wind's movement, uh, the body movements, um, uh, everything should be the same. 
it just could come from our student mind. Mm. Yeah. So basically, this Bodhisattva, he attained enlightenment because he could recognize the winds, elements, and the the previous Bodhisattva, Bodhisattva recognize uh, the water elements. And now the, I mean, that the first one that we read is he recognized the earth elements. It makes sense now, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why when he levels the earth around, the, the, the Buddha told him that he needed to level his mind. So he recognized the earth. His, the molecules in his body is, is not different from the world system. And the next one, the one that um, merged himself as the water, he probably he recognized the water elements uh, is everywhere. And for this one, for this Buddhist one, he's recognized the wind elements everywhere, whether it's his body or not, whether it's body or, or the wood system, whether it's small or, or big. It's a similar pattern, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So it's so dynamic, right? It's so not it's not one way. Everyone has different. Uh, yeah, it problems. makes me think how um, in in any like in one part one can find the whole. In in a in one part, so even taking one part like the wind, or one part like water, mm -hmm. the wholeness is represented within that. So it, then it can be that pathway to the wholeness. Hmm. Yeah, and in Buddhist view, you see the uh, little flowers behind on the screen, on, on my background there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they look really good. Really nice. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's nice and we are uh, summertime. Anyway, that everything surrounding us is not different from us. Whether the little flowers, whether the building, whether the the Bodhisattva statue, whether the pond and so forth, we are one of them. And they one of us. But in uh, our own mind, we see we are different from them. That's why the problem occur. Uh, we see uh, we are different from others. That's why we have all kinds of conflicts, all kinds of fightings. But if we see we are once uh, with them, well, it's not, we would not do any kind of problem for ourselves and others. Mm. Mm. So like in, in your treatment, right? Like you mentioned, right? When they have some kind of physical problem, you guide them, right? Well, like during that, like, the actual hands-on treatment mm -hmm. it's i wouldn't say that i'm guiding because really i don't know what needs to be done um but if what i do is i'm i'm listening or i'm feeling for for the flow so i'm feeling for the normal and then the abnormal stands out like the stuff where the flow can't go, where it's stuck. Mm -hmm. And then it's just a matter of like finding in that area that feels abnormal, that feels dense, seeing where does it want to go? Like what is the easy way for it to move? And it can be very, it's like a very subtle um, amount of force that I use. It's like a very small amount. But when it's when it goes right to where it wants to be, the flow will return. And then the flow can go through there. And then that's actually what will cause uh, like the release to happen, the body to let go of the thing that's holding. Mm -hmm. So I would say I'm working with inherent forces and those inherent forces are really leading. It's my skill depends upon my ability to listen to those forces and to not try to like be the one who does it. Mm. That I'm more of I'm more of of following uh, the ease of of what's there, not coming up with it. So most of the time, you won't prescribe prescribe the medicine for them. 
Well, I do. So that's the other end of like, I, I will use, uh, I like to use herbs a lot and I will use prescriptions when I really need to like pharmaceutical ones. And, and that's, I kind of have both ends of the approach. So, cause sometimes it takes a little bit of time to, if someone says, say in pain and we're working with that, well, there may be some herbs that could help them get better faster. Um, so I'll, I'll try to use kind of like a street fight. You know, if someone's in a street fight, they're going to do anything they can. There's no rules. And so I kind of, I try to have that same mentality when I'm helping someone that like, okay, I'll use anything that I can use that's going to help. Mm -hmm. well, that's right. Anyway, okay. So let's start. Uh, we stop 